So I guess it's time to continue with the tutorial again. Uh, Ronnie spent time speaking about a lot of search techniques. And I will just scratch uh, the reduction-based techniques because you are probably waiting for the more interesting part about beyond multi-agent pathway. I mean, the classical <laughs> one, OK? Uh, so reduction-based techniques are techniques for people like me that are a bit lazy and that would like to exploit knowledge of others to solve my own problems. Because the idea is that you translate the problem to some another formalism and you use a solver for that another, uh, another translated problem. Okay? Uh, why it's useful? Uh, first, uh, you do it once, and if anybody improves a solver like the SAT solver, immediately your system is much, much faster. And you don't do anything, right? So it's good because uh, your uh, system is improving and you are not doing any, any extra work, OK? Uh, but you, know, you depend on many people. Uh, so you can really exploit a lot of knowledge uh, from, from them. Uh, and it's also quite nice to model the problems because, as you will see, uh, you, you know, Ronnie described the algorithms but did not show you the code and the implementation of these codes. And that's a different story, right, if you want to implement the algorithm. I will show you the implementations and you will see the codes, <laughs> really executable codes, are much, much smaller. So this is called reduction or compilation or reformulation techniques because we translate the problem uh, to, to another one. Okay? Uh, so we are using, uh, in, in specifically I'll be talking about, uh, about SAT, about, about using SAT solvers. So very, very briefly, uh, SAT solver in recent uh, years become very popular because of fast SAT solvers. Uh, the other approach can be using CP, which, was, which is my original era. But surprising, I'm not going to talk about CP here. Why CP is good? Because for CP, people developed a lot of global constraints, which are very efficient uh, systems for pruning search space. Uh, so again, you can exploit these techniques. Uh, but there are other systems like answer set programming, which also translate at the end to, to SAT, but it provides you a higher level declarative framework. So it again makes uh, the model much smaller and easier to read. And there are some other uh, maybe surprising techniques like exploiting combinatorial auctions to solve, uh, to solve this problem. So as I said, I'll be talking about SAT. So I guess most of you, perhaps all of you know what is SAT. Uh, so the idea is that the problem is expressed as a, as a SAT formula, a formula, a logical formula in, in conjunctive normal form. So what does it mean? We can use only Boolean variables with true or false values or zero, one values. Uh, we connect these variables uh, to clauses, where clause is a disjunction of variables or negations of these variables called, called literals, and the formula is a conjunction of these clauses. So it's a very limited language that you can use, uh, but as you will see, we can express many problems in, in this formula. And what we are looking for, or we are asking the SAT solver for, is providing solution, meaning instantiation of the Boolean variables, such that the formula is satisfied, it's, it's true. Or telling no, uh, that there is no instantiation satisfying the formula. So Ronin asked many questions, so I have also like one question. So what this formula is saying in, in a human language, I would say. I mean, yeah, if I ask this to students, they, they simply read the formula to me and say, no, I mean in a language <laughs> that people outside the university can understand. False? I hope no. <laughs> <laughs> True, uh, probably also sometimes, yes, but it's not always. Exactly one object. Yeah, right? So in a human language, this formula is saying exactly one of these x or y's is equal to 1, or exactly one of them is true. Meaning it's not possible for both x and y to be true, and it's not possible for both x and y to be, uh, to be false, OK? Uh, so we'll be encoding everything in formulas like this, okay? Specifically, specifically we will be using this type of, of formula. So uh, 
Uh, we will be using actually more abstract versions of SAT because you know writing everything in CNF is probably not that human readable. Uh, so we will be using uh, more abstract expressions like this one. Well, the first one is very simple abstraction implication rather than writing uh, the disjunction. Uh, but the other one is let's say more tricky. If we see the Boolean variables as zero, one variables, we can write a formula. Some of the set of Boolean variables is greater or equal than one, which means uh, at least one of them is equal to one. So it's a simple disjunction. If you put equality, then it's more tricky to translate uh, it to to sort equality. It's basically what I described in the previous slide. Exactly one of these Boolean formulas equals to one, which can be translated to this one, greater or equal than one, and small or equal than one, meaning at most one and at least one uh, type of constraint. So we can see that this is at least one, and for at most one, it's more tricky. We need to have a lot of disjunctions, for example. Okay, and we can even use numerical variables uh, and. They can be encoded in various ways to start, for example, uh, using logarithmic encoding to encode numbers, one, one possible way how to do it. But the good thing is that we don't need to do this because there are, uh, uh, there are solvers or languages that do this translation for, for us. So I will now show you some core ideas how SAT can be applied to solve uh, multi-agent pathfinding. And I will also show you really, really the formulas. So what's the problem of multi-agent pathfinding from, uh, from the perspective of SAT or CSP? Well, it's a planning problem. And the problem with planning problems is that we don't know the size of the solution. We don't know how, length, how long uh, the, the plan is because the agents may revisit the nodes. Okay? But there is a well-known technique uh, how to solve planning problems by translating them to fixed length formulas. And it's based on idea of looking for a solution of a given length. Okay? So rather than looking for a general solution, we encode the problem, find a plan with a given number of steps, and if we fail, we just add one more step or a few more steps. Okay? So the idea is that we use what's called a temporary extended graph or layered graph, where each layer corresponds to one time slice. So we have a given number of time, slice, time, time slices, each describing situation at a given time. And we encode each slice to SAT formula, and the trans trans uh, transitions are encoded into SAT formula. Okay? So it, it looks like this. So we have a, uh, graph and locations of agents describing situation at one time, and then we describe the situation in the next time, and so on. So for each of these uh, layers, we have a SAT formula describing a correct location of agents, and we need to connect these two formulas describing the correct, correct transitions, meaning if the blue agent is here, where the blue agent can be in the second layer, where well, it can stay at V1 or it can move uh, to V2. So we need to encode states and we need to encode transitions. And that's, that's, basically, that's basically it. Okay? So let me, st let me start with uh, uh, one of the first encodings by, by Pavel Surinek, uh, which, is, uh, which is actually not using Boolean variables, but it's using uh, <coughs> multi-state, uh, multi-valued state variables where each variable describes a position of agent in the graph. So the variable looks like this. We have two indexes, agent and uh, layer. And the value of this variable is the number of the node where the agent is, is located. Okay. Uh, so what are the constraints? Well, we need to describe the transitions, meaning uh, if at some, some time i, the agent is at location L, at time i plus 1, the agent is either at location L or it's in one of the neighboring locations of location L. Well, that's it. Uh, what's next? Well, no train constraint, meaning uh, uh, if the agent uh, wants to be at uh, some location B, at some location uh, at time i, then this location should be different from all other locations at time i plus 1 or for all other agents. Okay? And uh, uh, as I mentioned for the CSP, we can do the same for, for SAT. Uh, if we want to say that agents are at different locations at each time, we can use the all different constraint for each layer. So we can say all the variables describing locations of agent in, in a given layer should be different. So all agents should be, should be at different, different nodes. So this is one of the encodings. Uh, uh, the other one is more perhaps straightforward. It's called direct SAT encoding. And uh, 
it encodes directly the position of the agent at a, at a given time using Boolean variable. Now, so ra rather than multi multivariate variable, we use the variable i, uh, sorry, x i j k, where we have uh, uh, layer, then we have uh, agent, and finally we have the node. Okay, so if this variable is true, it means that at a given time, given layer, given agent is at given node. Okay, uh, so what are the constraints? Where uh, for each layer, the agent should be placed in exactly one one node. In the pre-OS encoding, it was easy because we have one variable indicating the location, so it was one location. Now we have many variables for each node uh, that they can be true or false. So we want to say that exactly one of these x variables for a given agent, a given layer equals one is, is true. Right? So this is the exactly one, one constraint, meaning it's at least in one position and it's not at two positions at the same time. It's not at two nodes, uh, J and L at the same time. Okay? Similarly, if you want to say that node two agents are at the same node, we select the node. In this case, in this case it's the node J. Uh, and uh, we, we take the layer i and we say that agents k and h are not at the same node, meaning both of these variables are not, not true at the same time. So this is about single layer, uh, about the transitions where the agent can either move or stay. Okay? So it means that uh, if the agent is at, uh, at, uh, at some node j at time i, that at time i plus 1, the node is either at node j or it's in one of these nodes L, which are neighbors of, of J. Okay? And this is uh, going in the other direction. Okay? So the node, uh, sorry, the agent is at, uh, at node J at time i plus 1 if it can go from some, uh, some previous node uh, to, to get there. Okay? And if, if you want to express no swap and no, no, no train constraint, it can be done this way, meaning uh, if the agent uh, K is moving from node J to node L in times A I, to I plus 1, that no other agent H is moving in the opposite direction from L to, uh, to, to J. Okay. So this is the, the no swap constraint. As you can see, this is not that easy to read. So uh, yeah, this is comparison with uh, one of the search uh, algorithms, uh, ODID. And, uh, uh, we can see the all different and the direct encoding, the number of agents and runtimes. So we can see that the search technique was, this is like an artificially generated grid 8 times 8 uh, uh, with 10% of randomly placed obstacles. So this is the search technique uh, which finished quite soon. And these are the other uh, side based techniques. Uh, basically, we would say that if the error is really overcrowded, so there is not a, a lot of space, then uh, the search techniques are worse than the sub-based techniques, right? Uh, so this is somehow continuation of discussion where we should use which, which, which algorithm, okay? But let me show you now uh, a model which is, I hope, easier to, to read. We call it a mixed model. It still uses the layered graph. It still uses the same Boolean variables uh, like before. Agent A is at time t uh, at node v. But we express the constraints in a hopefully easier to read way. So to say that agent occupies exactly one vertex, uh, vertex at a given time, we basically make a sum of all these variables for all the vertices, and we say that it, it's equal to 1. This is then translated, obviously, to, to the SAT formula. If you want to say that no two agents occupy the same <coughs> vertex at the same time, uh, we fix the vertex and the layer, and we make the sum through all the agents, meaning uh, at most one of them is at a given node at a given time. So the sum should be smaller or equal than, than one, which is again translated to sub. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, the transition is described again easily. If the agent is at, uh, at, some, at some node v, meaning this variable equals one, then it should be in one of the neighboring nodes in the next, in, in the next layer. And we include in the neighborhood the node itself. Okay. Can you see anything uh, perhaps not that intuitive in the last formula? If you can understand the formula. Greater or equal than 1, right? 
why greater is equal than 1? It should be equal 1. Because the agent moves to exactly 1 node. Right? So why greater or equal than 1? Any, any idea? Well, to, to understand this, you really need to know something about SAT. It's much more efficient that way. Uh, like exactly 1 is much more um, expensive to encode. Exactly, right? So as I showed the constraint before, if equal 1 needs to be translated uh, to much larger SAT formula, while greater or equal than 1 is a simple disjunction. So it's much easier to translate. Uh, and we don't need equal to 1 because it's already here, right? So by combination, these, in, but to these two constraints, we ensure that the agent moves to exactly one node in the, in the next layer. Okay? And we can do some improvements of this encoding. Uh, because yeah, this is correct encoding, but we can realize that if the agent is at some node, and it takes at least five steps to reach some other node, then it's clear that in the next layer, the node cannot be, uh, sorry, the agent cannot be at that node because you need five steps, right? So you can set these variables to zero. Actually, it's much better to remove these variables from the solver at all, but simply we can set them to zero. And we can do the same from the end, right? So if we know that at the end, the agent must be at some node and we need some number of steps to reach <coughs> that node, uh, all, other no uh, all other nodes that are not in that distance can be removed from the possible path, right? And it, it helps a lot. I mean, it's a very simple, naive idea somehow, but it improves the efficiency of the solver a lot. Similarly, like this one, one, one symbol. So I said that uh, uh, it's much harder to encode search-based algorithms, uh, and it's much easier to do the modeling, and this is the reason, right? So this is executable code in a programming language called PyCat, which is like a prolog-like language. Uh, so it's a, it's a declarative language. And if you look at it, uh, uh, and if you map what you see here with the previous slide, you can see more or less one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So uh, we incrementally generate the number of layers, as I said, from some lower bound to upper bound. Then we define this, uh, then we define, where is it? This uh, layer of Boolean variables, you know, three indexes. The values are 0 to 1, so these are Boolean variables. Then uh, we have the constraint describing the initial position. So in the first layer, it's in the initial position, E. And in the last layer, it must be in the final vertex, final position. So these two variables are equal 1. Uh, so this is the second uh, type of constraint. Uh, then uh, this is the sum, which says, OK, the, the, the agent is it exactly one node in each layer. right? So we make a sum through all the vertices for a given agent at a given time. Uh, then the no conflict, uh, I mean the ver no vertex conflict is here. So we make the sum through all the agents for a fixed vertex and time. Should be small or equal to one, exactly as I described before. And uh, this is the transition. So we take the neighborhood and uh, we say, okay, it must be in one of the neighboring nodes, sums greater or equal to one. Right? And this is really executable code. So this is the only thing I need to do to, do to solve the problem. And then, if you look here, we just say, OK, solve it using SAT. And if you don't like SAT, you can say import CP. And you can solve the same problem using CP. Or import MIP. So you can solve exactly the same model using mixed integer, integer programming. And the translation to specific uh, type of constraints supported by the solvers is done by, uh, by the language itself. And why it's nice? Well, because if you want to add constraints like the K robustness, you just add a very easy to read code. Like, what does K robustness mean? Well, we take the, all the Boolean variables <coughs> for a given node for the last K steps, and it must be zero, the sum of them. Meaning, it should, no, no agent should be there, right? So, this is a, the sum and should be equal to zero. So, it's very easy to express models in, 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 in SAT. And uh, yeah, it's reasonably comparable. Uh, this is, these are some set of problems. Uh, these are runtimes for these problems. So when we optimize the make span, we compare with a, a handcrafted SAT encoding, meaning this is really somebody wrote the SAT formula. This is what we did in the PyCAD. So you can see the runtimes. Well, it's not the same, but somehow comparable, at least in the same range. 
Uh, this is some encoding in uh, untrusted programming, which was not that successful in this case. Uh, and for the sum of costs, uh, uh, it's not that good, but this is an old result because now we can solve all 20 problems with the PyCAD just using a different encoding that will be presented next week at SOX uh, and in a couple of weeks at each kind of workshop. Question? Uh, no. No, no. Uh, so I just wanted to show that this simple code is somehow uh, as efficient as, uh, as other techniques where you spend months by encoding them because this is just one page. So, yeah, first. A technical question, if you use uh, SAT solving for, uh, to, to solve this, are you making use of incremental SAT solving no. when you extend your maximum? That's a great question, great idea. I still did not convince the author of PyCAD to use the incremental SAT solving. So right now, it's not incremental SAT solving. It's, it's unfortunately the classic one. Right. So when you compare it with the search-based methods, do they also work on, on large grids, like Thousands of grid cells? Uh, yeah, this is where SAT has the problems, right? Mm -hmm. So SAT is Got good when we have very, very small area with many robots, but obviously if we have a huge grid, then you saw the encoding, right? So we have a huge number of variables. We can prune some of them by this preprocessing, but at the end, not at all. So we are working with uh, not that big grids. Actually, these numbers are telling what are. This is the size 32 times 32 grid. All right, so 900 nodes approximately. Not, not a huge one. Okay. No. Yes. That's good. I think I might have missed it. But how do you, how do you encode the like optimal make span? Like oh, okay. Path? So for for make span, or how how do we encode? How do we look for optimal make span? This is actually easy for SAT because we are incrementally adding the layers. And the number of layers is actually the make span. Because we are going from the lower bound, which is uh, the maximum of the shortest passes, incrementally, the first satisfiable formula is the optimal make span. So make span is easy. Sum of costs is more tricky, as you may guess, because if you find a solution with the smallest make span, it does not mean that this is the best sum of costs. So you may need to add few more layers. Okay? And there are tricks how to, how to do it so you don't add that many layers. Uh, uh, yeah, SOX paper next week uh, or, uh, where we present uh, the, 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 the approach where we can solve all these problems, for example. Uh, it's, more, it's more tricky and more, I mean, uh, you, you need to understand a bit the behavior of relation between SOX, sum of cost, and make span. But yeah, it's possible even in SAT. But CBS is much, much better, I would say, for this type of problems, even if we can beat it here. <laughs> OK. So uh, yeah, this is actually the explanation <laughs> of it, right? So uh, for make span, it's, it's very easy because we are incrementally adding the layers. For sum of cost, uh, uh, okay, what, so what's the idea? Uh, we calculate the, the, the lower bound for sum of cost. And when we find uh, a solution which is equal to this lower bound, uh, then we have the optimal solution for sum of cost. Uh, if, uh, if we find a layer where there is a solution but it's not the lower bound, we increase both uh, the lower bound for SOC and we add one more layer. So we somehow parallelly increase the lower bound so for sum of cost and uh, we add the, the layers. So the first layer we find with a given lower bound for sum of cost is the optimal for sum of cost. But we use some other, other tricks that, can, uh, that, that allows us to, uh, to jump, right? So we, generate, we need to add more layers even if there already exists a solution, uh, but with, uh, with a larger than lower bound uh, sum, of, sum of cost, right? Uh, so this is uh, the original Pavel, Pavel Surinek uh, suggests the idea of incrementally adding the layers. And in the SOX paper, <coughs> we suggested the idea where we directly jump to the right level. So we don't need to add the layers in between. We just go there and we use branch and bound to optimize uh, the sum of cost for, for, this type of, for this type of problem. OK, yeah, question. So there's a question on, on what you just said. Is it done as a script on top of PyCAD? No, no, it's done, it's done inside PyCAD so because PyCAD is a generic programming language. It's also a scripting language <coughs> in some sense. So it's done in PyCAD, just different calls to the labeling procedure or the search procedure. I must say, I mean, I like it, but if 
a little bit the purpose of using PyCAD because it's uh, the model is so compact and concise, but now you make it more complex by doing the. Oh, uh, not not really. I mean, if if you look at the code, it's not much longer than what I presented. Okay. Uh, there is one more feature that during the labeling, even with SAT, you can solve optimization problem. So you can say like in CP, minimize or maximize a value of some variable. And the rest, adding the layers, is not so complicated. <coughs> so it's just f really few lines of code. No, no more than uh, what I can put on the slides still. Uh, I was wondering, this SAT solver does spend more time in proving in uh, in um, proving that the problem is not solvable or in the last layer when there is a solution? Yeah, so yeah, this is the question whether uh, we spend more time on unsatisfiability problem or whether uh, we spend more time on satisfiability. If I remember right, unsatisfiability is obviously the more complicated part, especially because we repeat it for, for many layers. When we have, when we know the the right size of the plans and finding the solution is usually fast. But in unsatisfiability, it's more complicated. So having a way to find a good uh, lower bound uh, would improve uh, the performance. Yes, yes. And that's, for example, the reason why our new uh, implementation of sum of costs is much, much faster than the incremental one, which uses many unsat formulas. Because what we do is uh, we use the branch and bound, so we use SAT formulas, and we are adding more and more constraints. So that's why it's faster. I remember that for the classical planning, solved a SAT using internal ones. Instead of solving the problem layer by layer, you are adding more. Problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To find that that's, that's one way, uh, rather than jumping to to the next layer, adding like two layers, four layers, and so on. We did not try that. Uh, we do something like this for the sum of cost, but not for the make span, because the formulas are quite large. So I'm not, not sure if it's working. We, we did not try it for, for multi-gen pass plan. Yeah. Another question, yeah. yeah. Is it a case by any chance that when you find a solution, the majority of variables is set to false? Just a yeah, yeah, yes, definitely. Because in each layer, you have variables for each node. So only one of them will be, will be could, one. Could, so that, could that be exploited somehow? Uh, well, we exploit it in the preprocessing a bit because we know that some of them should be zero. Uh, uh, how to exploit it more? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it can, but I don't know. Some I don't know Maybe, you know, we don't care about the SAT, so we just call the SAT solver. Uh, there is uh, one way how we can exploit it a bit. Uh, you know, if we do not allow agent to go back to the same node, then you don't need that many variables. You just need like variables indicating the nodes where the agent is, and you know that they are not repeated somehow. Right. But then we restrict uh, the space because the agent is not allowed to return back. So then the encoding is smaller, and we don't have that many zero variables. Right? It's just like telling, oh, I will go through these nodes. And then you can reconstruct the paths from, from it. But it's not complete, because sometimes you need to, to step away and go back. I, I, I think that the, the, you've seen some of his work, he, he modified the SAT solver to make it more planning oriented. So maybe that's something along that line. Like maybe the search process of, 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 of the solver trying to make it more faster. That's, that's interesting, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we don't modify the SAT solvers, definitely, that's not our error. But the incremental SAT solvers might be a great, a great here. Because we are actually repeatedly solving formulas which are very similar. Especially if we are doing optimization, branch and bound. So, so everything is the same, we just put one more bound variable. This variable should be small or equal to something. So I believe that incremental SAT solving should improve dramatically efficiency of this. Maybe if the SAT solver uh, learns those uh, conflicts, maybe Yeah, incremental actually means that you can reuse what you learned before. Uh, and now we call the SAT solver from scratch, so the SAT solver needs to learn these conflicting clauses again and again, but incremental SAT solver can reuse them from the previous iteration. That's the reason why it's faster. 
So yeah, it, it can be reversed. Oh, That's not always true, right? Because what also happens is you may mislead set solvers because you learn things about the smaller problem, which is unsatisfiable. The solver will first look at these scores, and the new ones, they have no, no heuristic values. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like generating tests. You first guess the smaller problem, mm -hmm. and then you find, oh, that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. So it's... Yeah, it's not, it's not always. But in this case, I believe it should be useful because we really keep the real constraints there, and we are just... Uh, putting constraints with, I mean, uh, stronger and stronger constraints, something like this. Because we, we use a variable, small or equal than the bound, and we just put stronger bounds. So this is just the part that is being changed when we do optimization. So it's not like small or larger problem. The problem, the number of rows is the same, exactly. Just one constraint is becoming stricter and stricter. So I believe it should be very good. Uh, but we, we did not try it. Open such question. Okay. No more questions. Yeah, I guess you really want to see this uh, beyond stuff. Okay. So I, I will show you first something that we did and that might be quite fun. It will be somehow uh, an invitation to demo session uh, yesterday. Uh, sorry, tomorrow. Uh, so w what we did is uh, we tried to apply the multi agent pass finding techniques, the plans, in, in, in real robots. And the question was, if I, find, if I find a plan using some abstract solver, and if I translate this plan to a robot, is it OK? I mean, in multi-agent path finding, we have many uh, assumptions. All actions uh, take the same time, OK? Uh, all agents are perfectly following the plan, OK? And we know that in, in reality, this is not always the case. So we developed some versions of solvers, classical ones. We added weighted edges. Uh, we added rotations to the agent because the agents need to rotate. And we have this uh, simple uh, software I will show you to, you to you in a minute where you can uh, build a gri grid light map. Uh, this is this part. Okay. Uh, so you just remove the nodes and edges. Uh, then you can place the agent there. So it's still classical in sense of initial and go location. Uh, then uh, you can select the solver. We use this PyCAD solver, so different PyCAD models that will generate the plan for you. And uh, we can then translate this plan uh, to, uh, to robots that look like this. They are called Ozobots and they follow it. Uh, we are not doing robotics, so we just use existing robots. They can follow the line, they can do all the low level stuff. We just tell what we as AI people like to do. Go forward, turn right, and so on. Question, yeah. Is it okay to take pictures? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so in this software, we can show the simulation, but as I said, we can also translate it to, uh, to, to the robots. So now I will try to show you the software itself. And if you are happy enough, I will show you also the real robots. So this is a very simple problem. Uh, uh, somehow something is wrong. Let me. Ah, still something is missing, doesn't matter. Now you can see almost everything. So we have this very simple grid. Uh, there are three agents. The initial locations are marked by these uh, green flags. Uh, and they want to go to the goal locations, which are marked by these goal uh, flags. And the idea is that the agents are going like this. This one is going here. This one is going there. And there is this one which is going here, right? So it's a very simple problem. They just somehow rotate, right? So we generated the solution uh, using the classical multi-agent pathfinding. And this is how it's expected to work, right? Perfect solution, right? So I will now show you how this perfect, simple solution in multi-agent pathfinding looks with <laughs> real robots. At least I will try, but I have never did it before. So it might be quite, quite fun. So how many hands a researcher have to handle three robots? We will, we will see in a moment. So I have 
So these are the robots. Yeah, question. Why, why did it not go the other way? Uh, this is how the plan was found, right? If they go the other way, they might be going uh, against each other. So I believe this is the easiest way just to rotate them. Because they all go in the same direction somehow. OK, let me, let me show it again. Right, so you need to you you need to go uh, to the node which is two nodes away. So if that one is going in this direction, that, that, that there will be a crash with the other one. They have to go to two nodes away. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all of them, all of them are just moving two nodes away. Because right? the plan is optimal, right? And this is optimal. Yeah, yeah. We always generate oh, optimal plans. Two nodes away was the constraint. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not the constraint. The the the, the, the goal is simply Can defined. No, 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 no. It's a specific goal. It's not. It's not anyone, right? So it's a specific goal for each for each agent. Okay. Good. So we have the robots here, uh, very small ones. So first, I need to use a trick, and uh, then I will use the camera to show you the robots. Hopefully. So let let's try it. That's fine, I will just prepare them, and then. So this is a live demo? Yes. And if you want to see more, come tomorrow to demo session, and you will see even more fun. <laughs> OK, so now I will show it to you, I hope. So you see, three robots there prepared to go. And now this was the perfect plan in multi-agent fast finding, right? So it should be just easy to follow. So this is what happens. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so, and it always happens like this. So come tomorrow to the demo and I will show you the same one and it will go exactly the same way, right? <laughs> so this is just, showing that, uh, let's say, doing the research with computer is not always the same as applying the <coughs> results in practice. So it was a perfect plan, but uh, it was not working. Uh, so uh, I will show you another plan, uh, which uh, is uh, using rotation of the robots. And uh, you will see that the plan is slightly different, right? So you can see. Now they are going in the other direction and they are also waiting. <coughs> and the reason is that they assume uh, the rotation actions as well. So they assume that rotation takes some time. In the previous model, we don't assume rotation, right? So we assume that doing this is exactly the same as doing this and going this way, which is not the case in practice. OK, so that's, uh, that's it about the the multi-agent pathfinding on, on the robots. And let's go back to the presentation and something much closer to reality. Yeah. This is the backup solution if it's not working. Oh, so OK. So we will move to the Asprilo system now, which is not just playing with kids robots, but uh, doing some real warehousing. Okay. Also playing, just <laughs> <laughs> in software, so it doesn't run up the table. Good, so. Thank you.
uh, must have problem. And uh, so I want to start with uh, uh, basically reformulate, so basically precisely formalize the problem uh, that uh, Ronnie and Ronan have been talking about. So basically we, the map F problem can be formalized by a, uh, uh, a given a graph, right? And then uh, a graph with a set of uh, edge and vertices and then a set of robot and then the starting of uh, fu two function, one map, the, um, one specifies the starting point of the, uh, of the robot, and the other one specifies the final, the target of the robot. And then the set of action, basically the set of action here, it's an implicit. There's either you move to the next vertex or you stay, right? So, and there are many, many um, extensions of this, uh, of the map app from that uh, could be kind of like looking at, okay, if we change the ch graph, if we change the set of robot, if we change the s how the target is specified, or if we change the uh, set of action, how they are specified. Uh, uh, we enrich them, then we have a different problem. And I discuss a few of them, and uh, then uh, at the end, Thorsten is going to talk in depth about one of them. So. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, so the goal. Of course, the goal of the map is um, to find the multiple path, and uh, th they are not uh, allowed to be uh, colliding. And then, whether it is uh, we, we we are interested in minimal max span or uh, minimal sum cot, and so on and so forth. So that's something. Now, uh, even in map F, uh, there are kind of like slight different uh, formalization that people talk about. One is like. Non, -anim uh, non anonymous and the other one is anonymous. What does this mean? It means that, uh, so basically, in the standard one that we have been talking about until this point, it's the standard one where it is non, -anon non anonymous, meaning that each agent is assigned a specific target. So I think Ronan have briefly mentioned where, se where the, 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 the second case is, the variation where it's anonymous, meaning that I have an a an, uh, the set of agents, and then I have a set of uh, targets, but I don't need to specify which one go to which one. I just need, uh, uh, basically, I just need this target to be visited, uh, so to say. Uh, and so uh, we can change that formalization, the origi original generation, to a kind of a different function, whether this one is a target A, now a subset of V. And in most of the, in most of the formalization that we have seen so far, uh, the, uh, there is a constraint, implicit constraint that one agent, one target. So you don't have that. So, and for, for anonymous uh, map F, the a possible uh, way to solve it is that, okay, we just randomly as associate uh, the agent to the target and then solve it using any of the method that we have before. But uh, that when we, when we do not care about the global optima, if we care about the global optima, we have to basically find the best assignment, that you, the best uh, solution. Right? Now, there have been also, uh, so this is a kind of like the, the next uh, extension uh, that have been discussed by uh, by Hang and uh, Sven and other is the one of that is that when we change the set of basically we we change a view of the set of robots, right? Uh, so it is argued that in this case that uh, basically you uh, robots usually work in the teams. And uh, this each of the team is assigned a set of targets. So we could formal, we could look at that as a collection of uh, a collection of, of, of anonymous uh, map F problem like together. And you can we can formalize that as like okay I have the graph I have the, uh, the the collection of agents so multiple teams of robots are one to RK and the the, the specification of the Initial location is the same, but uh, the target here is the uh, uh, set of targets assigned to each of the teams. So it, it doesn't matter to me if 
uh, robot one and two is in the same team and go to like different target. So that, and it turned out that the, this problem, it, like the solution, like uh, have been so far. It's one of the, so the the algorithm it proposed by uh, Hangma and Sven Kuenek, and it's basically uh, using the mud flows. The idea <coughs> is to use a mean cost flow algorithm to solve it. And uh, it is, it's a two, uh, it's a two level algorithm. The high level is to consider the team as a meta agent and then move them uh, in each of the, uh, in each of the layer. And then in each of the layer to try to, do, to resolve the uh, conflict uh, it that. So I'm, I'm quite hand waving here though, but you have an idea of how, how that's solved. So, and then um, we have, uh, in 2017, we do kind of like we look at the, at the top F problem. We generalize that. Uh, so we generalize that in the sense that we have here we have also team of agents. We also have the location, the starting location, the same. But we add that what we call that the group of tasks. So basically, uh, each of the tasks now is a set of orders. So the the the, the inspiration or the idea, the motivation for the Chita problem is the uh, basically the order fulfillment centers like the warehousing. And that's where we get to the warehousing in the next, in the next step. So here, uh, and then here we have like uh, a lot of extension uh, that is involved also like uh, there is uh, whether there is a checkpoint. So also, some of the uh, some of you had mentioned asked about whether there are uh, so the robot each of the robot need to go through certain uh, sequence of location before certain. So we call that uh, so have the orders and the deadline. And then here in this in each of the order here, uh, we also consider the case that in order to reach the destination you have to go through a, a set of a sequence of checkpoints. So that, that uh, and uh, we solve this uh, problem is in a similar fashion as, uh, as Ronan did. Uh, so we are lazy, we translate it into answer set programming and we do all this and we have, we compare with uh, what we did, we compare with uh, a solver of uh, CBM and it turned out that uh, same thing as uh, uh, as with uh, with chat solver, uh, our method of uh, uh, solving a tab F, for example, uh, it's it's good when there are a lot of conflicts to be solved. But if there is uh, in, in the problem where few conflicts, uh, the the standard way, uh, the the algorithm based uh, method is much better. And we were able to uh, we were able to scale up to quite a bit with the cheetah problem where we uh, simulate the situation in a warehouse where uh, order need to be uh, satisfied with by going to some place picking some some shelf and then deliver to a to a final destination and then remove that uh, we were able to solve um, to go quite large um, quite large, um, uh, like uh, we take that from the Kiva system where like 10 by 10 uh, stat and then we were able to do that by 6, 10. So about 600, uh, 600 uh, shelf, like 600 shelf, you know this thing. So uh, that's just to say that uh, we would be, and then now, there are quite a, a number of uh, variants of GTAP that we did consider, like group completion, where uh, so basically each of the tasks is a, is a set of orders, and each of the order is a set. It, each of the order need to be uh, each of the group of the order need to be complete completely before other order is uh, taken place. For example, and task deadline or completion with the checkpoint. That's what I'm saying. And that's how we how we did that. Uh, so now, uh, other considerations that have been considered, I think that uh, 
Ronin have mentioned some of that uh, in, the, in the previous case, even when there is no uh, tap or chi tap, like continuous or discrete movement, or uh, offline, online, uh, and checkpoint, and uh, suboptimal sub solution. And, 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 and so if, if we wanted to solve a large problem, it's very likely that optimality is a very big, uh, big, big hurdle. And then now uh, there are some, there are one work that I have noted by Hang Ma and Sven is that uh, about uh, like uh, considering the, uh, the action of like, transferring the uh, load from one robot to the other robot, for example. But, uh, and then uh, there is one paper in the last Triple uh, AI, as I noted that uh, some of you were asking about like what is the three dimensions. So uh, I think that there is work in that direction already. Uh, it's so in three dimensions, basically thinking about drones here. Like when you have multiple drones, you wanted to control them. And then that's, that, that's one of the situation. And now I'm going to like from map F to Aspiro. So uh, in TAP or GTAP, we only change the consideration about the set of robots. We do not consider the set of actions changed. But in Aspiro, so basically, we change, ro we change the situation where robot now have much many, many more actions to, uh, to do. Right? Say, for example, in the real warehouse, the robot need to pick up certain shelf, move it to somewhere else, drop it, and so on and so forth. So there is a robot can pick up or put down object, or it need to charge also, like maintaining its battery level. And then the consequence is that we have a much richer environment to work with. We have, to, we have new objects to work with. So, so, so far, uh, the, our, our, our graph or our map just is this location, whether this location could be used or could, could the robot could move to that or not, right? But now, like, there is a shelf in there if you wanted to go there or if you, can, if you can't go there and so on and so forth. And then when we have that, we basically have a lot more uh, what, what we usually call then the fluence, much more like the set of fluence also increase. So what the consequence of that, and I uh, think Torsten is going to talk about that, like when we increase them, increase this, oh, this, the, the encoding in answer set programming or the encoding in, uh, in, in, in SAT server will become much more complicated. And now, to Yep, yep. Good. That's yeah. Well then, so actually, do you mind about describing this Brillo and, and the motivation actually for that? Actually, I personally was uh, fixed onto that. <laughs> So better now? Good. So anyway, um, so I came across this actually at, I think, Ichikai 11 or so in Buenos Aires, where Bernard should, when, when was Ichikai in Buenos Aires? 2011? Uh, 15, yeah. So there was actually an invited talk by someone from the Kiva company who actually more or less pushed this a lot and who were then bought off by Amazon. And at the time I thought, oh, that's a great, that's a great domain in particular to, 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 to combine technology from different research communities and actually to, to bring them together and, 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 and have them exchange ideas. But then on the other hand, it also became clear to me that to, to make communities or even researchers work on that, they need more or less an environment <laughs> to work with it, right? And that's actually was more or less the idea why, why we came up with this Asprillo, Asprillo uh, system in the setting of robotic interlogistics. So the, the objective was more or less how can one actually develop robust and scalable AI technology for dealing with complex dynamic application scenarios? That's of course very dense now as a phrase, right? But uh, the, the important thing is that if we really want to, to go, out of and, and, uh, go out of academia and solve real problems, we have to be robust and scalable. So, and and that's, that's, that's what you find a lot in, 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 in such uh, warehouse scenarios. And what is also cool about them, they are scalable from the benchmark scenario. So it's very 
if you if you have if you have benchmark for the certain tile, you just add more objects, and you can actually simulate scalability things. And keep in mind that if you work on real problems, it's normally very difficult to have scalable problems. So you you work on an ind industry project, you have one or two of or five examples, and then you, then you solve on them. But the next problem is, how do, how do you give them away? How can you make the re your, your results reproducible? And that's more or less all all a bit the, the original motivation of. Of, 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 of this. And I'm, our personal interest, of course, one of mine is, if, is in, in, in KR, right? And so what, what we needed is, was this fruit fly, and the idea was then, okay, let's take, let's take robotic interlogistic as such a model scenario. And because it, it just has all these facets that, that you can use, and you can, you can extend it in a way. And that's actually why I, I will mention this a couple of times. That we have this on, uh, publicly available open source on, on, on Git, and you're all free to, to use it, to extend it, and, and so on and so forth. Actually, I think meanwhile, since two or three years, we've run perhaps a dozen bachelors and a couple, well, less master thesis through this, doing extensions, doing work on that. It's great for teaching, and uh, that's more or less the idea. But I don't have, to, I think, perhaps to go into this. I think it's also clear that it's, it's very, um, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to illustrate our research. And at the end of the day, what is cool about it, you can always measure things, right? So you, you come up with a scenario, you take different algorithms for it, you let them run, and you measure who's really the best. In different, in different, in, in different terms, right? That doesn't uh, remain up in the air. So, and yeah, so that was more or less our motivation. And it, I don't think it's 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 worth going through all that. So the, the very concrete thing was was actually to to look at such warehouses here, where you have uh, robots lifting shelves, moving them around. Uh, and then you, you you have routing. You have so to fill to, to satisfy actually orders. You have routing. The robots have to move. You have order picking. How to to pick things from these shelves and replenishment and and also strategic questions, right? So where do you actually park such a guy? In summer, actually, you may assign different parking sites in winter because different products are used, right? Why why should you put the sw swim clothes in winter very close to the picking stations to, 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 to maximize uh, short, uh, short distance as well. Th I think there, there, this is, there's just lots of, lots of it. And meanwhile, there are actually quite some, quite some, some industry apart from Kiva, which I, I'd say is the most popular one. This is just a selection, and I think you, we could, you could add to this list in, in, in many respects. So um, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so let's just look at, uh, that, that's actually the Amazon video that you can find on, 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 on YouTube, actually, yeah. So, oh, even with that. And what, what, what we, uh, this was more or less to illustrate, and the next, I have, have yet another video for you to, 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 to illustrate a bit how this works. So what these guys do, they really work on a grid. So here you see these, um, these, three, these barcodes, right? And the only thing that they do, they move really from one barcode to the next, which is, of course, great for, instance, our research, because we don't have to care about free roaming robots. It's really just on the grid, and, and the abstraction is very nice. But then these guys actually go on their knees, and then at some point they, they lift them up, and they carry them around, um, and eventually actually drive, drive them, uh, execute a plan, and drive them to a picking station where a human actually is, 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 is taking items off the shelf, putting them in a container, and then this is shipped away. And that, that, that's just... And this is actually something that is called a highway, where they more or less have designated grid positions where you should not park, right? Because otherwise, actually, these things are more or less look physically very much the same, but logically, things are often divided into s storage zones and, 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 uh, and, and zones for, for... And here you see the picking station that this woman is just removing things from, from the shelf, putting them here into this container, and then ticking off, ticking off the order. Um, Let's just watch. This is now the, the, the Amazon Kiva system. Uh, this here is actually is the one from Swisslock. So Swisslock is actually owned by KUKA, which is a robotics manu uh, traditional robotics manufacturer. And uh, um, yeah, and what, 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 what we see here actually is more or less, again, what, what, what are all the concepts, the notions involved? The, the system is, pr is very, very similar. Just that they actually they have only shelves which open in, in, in two directions, so you can't turn them around in all four directions. So the robots. Yeah, same thing again. We have these grid situations here. There are, char there are charging stations inside. That's, that's a, um, 
then the, the racks here also have different have different um, have different uh, heights. You can configure them differently. So actually, Son and I we run a company on the side, right? <laughs> and uh, one of the one of the interesting questions sometimes is how to load these things. And the funny thing is, they know the height of their employees, so they actually then drive <laughs> drive to picking stations where they know that people can e more easily somehow put put rem well remove things from the upper shelf or the lower shelves, right? And so, so these are all very interesting questions, and you wouldn't uh, otherwise think about it, right? Yeah. What, what, what I think these videos make clear is that this is a very rich domain, right? And, and uh, it's, it's where I think our technology can actually ver very nice be illustrated and used, and, and, but perhaps let's, let's, let's move on. So this is more or less, if you just look at these videos and, 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 and look at what, what has been going on, what are the objects? You have floor, robots, shelves, products, people. Um, then positions, capacity of orientation, durations, and different types of actions, right? While, as, as Son was saying, in the, in, the, in the first part, we mainly talked, looked at move actions, right? Now, now all this other variety of actions comes. And of course, you can, you can it's, it's an open list, right? You can still think about, so what happens, I don't know, if you have a, 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 a cooled warehouse where actually uh, frozen stuff is transported with durations, and that's, this has to take priorities, can they over, you know? It's, it's, it's an endless thing. And of course, also the objectives, right? So we've seen make span and, and some, of, some of costs, right? But here as well, so how, how, what, what about the energy management, uh, the, the throughput, or et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea was more or less to say, okay, let's come up with a system that is open, that you can easily extend it and actually somehow simulate this to apply uh, research. Um, and so what, what we did actually with the, with the Sprillo, we, 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 we decided we needed, we needed a couple of components. One thing that was very important for, to me actually was that we, ha that we have, first of all, some standardized domains, right? So we've seen maps, but there are also other domains where it's clear, so wh where there is a certain specification. These are the actions, these are the, the effects of the actions, and that there is a certain, that there is a certain range, right? Where you can illustrate different, different, um, different, different um, concepts, right? So that's actually the first of all the, the, the benchmark domains. Then, <laughs> interestingly, it was wh while we were working with it that at some point it was clear to us we really need formal specifications as well, right? So you really have to pin things down in, in a very formal way to say to actually to, to sometimes to prove actually that you really do the right thing, and in su surprising enough, then w then the, here's a very pragmatic thing that that, that um, I, and I will illustrate this in more detail is a, is, a, is an instance generator. So well. But I haven't I haven't followed this up in in, 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 in now in the planning in the in, in the planning community. But for instance, if you look at the SAT community or the ASP community, it was very very important for these fields to have benchmarks, to have actually to have um, to have problems that you could scale, where you can actually with which you can develop the systems with which new research questions were emerging. Right at the beginning, these we had ma ma in these systems there were mainly combinatorial benchmarks. Well, color graph. Uh, do uh, co compute Hamiltonian circuits, right? And this, of course, helped. But at some point, this was not enough. So then there were more the industrial type of benchmarks, right? And and now there are new dimensions coming. But the important thing is, there were generators to read to to generate whole suits of benchmarks and to make them reproducible. And that actually was the first component that one of the first components that we put into place. So a, a, a generator that allows us to um, to generate uh, whole suits of benchmarks with certain properties, right? That you can put a tarball somewhere and then say, this is the benchmark we use, everybody else can use it too. Or you generate benchmarks. And I'll, I'll, I'll go in, in, into more detail. Next thing is visualizing things. Because again, if you, have a, if you, if you, if you color your graph or you, if you play an N-Queens problem, at least you can still look at, at the solution and, and do it as a human. But in these problems, you need, you need to visualize the solution that you get, even though if it's not valid. You want to see actually that your, that your robot su suddenly j jumps from one end to the other one because perhaps you may you you may miss this otherwise, right? Or what is the feature of your solution? So, so you wanted this animated and also somehow for 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 situations where the where the, the the candidate actually is not really a solution. And what actually what the problem that we solved with it actually is a graphical editor for instances. So what I will show you in in a, in a sec, you can actually take this visualizer and edit your base scenario, and then give this to the benchmark generator, and he will populate this in in different ways. So you 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 generate difficult things like with corridors or stuff like this first graphically, and then you generate hundreds of instances uh, in, 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 in that way. And uh, we, what we also have is an, is an automatic solution checker that, that, uh, that we use then to, to do that. And all this is actually general, this is actually a general purpose uh, 
system more or less where you can solve these problems with your system. The, 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 no matter in whether they are in Java or in SAT solver or in ASP, of course we do ASP because we like it, and the system is such as is parts are written in ASP, other parts in Python, right? But as such, once, once, you, once you, uh, you, you, you respect the interface, right? You read the input, you, you produce the right output, whatever you do in between is your business, right? Okay, then, and, and what we do since we, since we do ASP, we also supply some reference encodings on how to do this with ASP, but we don't impose ASP at, at all. So all this is on the web here in our, in our, at, at our Potasco site, a Sprillo, and uh, the basic thing is also described in a in, in, in paper on archive. Okay, let's go a little bit more into the details. So first of all, to install this, we recommend to use uh, the Conda package manager, which is cool because it's a package manager that you can use without being administrator of your system, right? Uh, and then you, you, you go to Anaconda and either some, uh, download Anaconda or Miniconda, both of them will do. And then this is more or less the installation. You, 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 you create your environment with, uh, with, with Python and then uh, you activate it. You install Klingo, which is the ASP system to, 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 to generate the benchmarks or, or, or to, to, to check things. And then you install the whole, you, you just uh, install that with Conda and then you're done, right? So getting Conda may be a hurdle, but uh, again, because you're not used to it, right? <laughs> but once you have it, it's, it's very straightforward to do it that way. Good, so, let's <coughs> so the, the, let me introduce one particular domain that's, we, we named it A, actually it took us months and we had different names every second day, right? And we, at some point we say, well, we don't, won't use numbers, but let's start with A, <laughs> right? Like a Sprillo. And that's more or less one that is close to, the, close to a warehouse scenario. You have a, a, a two-dimensional grid, you have shelves, and on these shelves are, are products, and th they can have a certain quantity, right? And every shelf occupies one grid node. The round thing actually are the shelves, and these uh, 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 quadratic things are the robots, and the reason why it's like this is because the robots can move under the shelf and you still see it. That's the only reason why this, the, the shelves are, are circles and, and, and the robots are, are, are squares. And as, as, as you've seen before, these robots then, the robots can then move under a shelf, pick it up, and then actually a dot will appear. And then they can move. This is, these are the picking stations. And then when, when depending on the scenario, actually, um, it's, it's, it, the picking rate is fixed, how, how much can be picked at a, at a certain time point, right? And then they, then they move on and so on. Good. And this is the, the how this is uh, shown graphically. So, so actually, the white spots here are, there are just storage areas. Rob robots can park here. The violet ones are highways, so you're not allowed to park here. Like p picking station, I think now I more or less explained everything on that. Yeah, that's uh, good. So such a scenario more is, is, is initially provided, and then orders have to be fulfilled. And fulfillment means different things depending on the scenario. And here it means uh, that orders are assigned, orders are given, they are assigned to picking stations, and then more or less different, different shelves have to be brought there so that uh, more as a human can pick them, right? But the human as such is for us a passive entity, right? It's, it's not an agent as, 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 as such that, that does things. One could extend that uh, as well. Good. Um, so here's, a, here's the first little demo, right? That's how the system now runs. So this is just animating a solution. So this is actually the plan. That's the solution. And this is now animated, right? So, and so you, the, ro the robot actually picked up this shelf here, brought it to this picking station. And here you see actually that an order is, is satisfied. And this will this, this continue. So we are now at time point 13, 14. Three actions, are the three actions can be done in parallel. Now only two of them are done. And so here you, you get some, some, some log of this. And this is more or less just the animation of your solution, no matter how you found it, right? This is not actually do, uh, c calculating the solution. What I should say, for instance, with ASP, this, this solution here can be generated in I don't know, half a minute or so, 30 seconds. And we'll, we'll see in a sec actually what we can do if we would not have that. So, so this is, these are more or less the domains. The domain A I just explained. And we have actually just domains currently that are, that are easier. So in, in, in B, we, we ignore the quantities, right? Because you know, ha dealing with all the quantities is, is quite something. Because, um, and, and we actually use this to, for instance, to, to evaluate our systems that have uh, that, 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 that are hybrid, with that where you can do also constraint processing inside. 
where you actually can deal with quantities of 5,000 because you have, you have a, a numerical variable for that, right? But again, if you, just, if you don't want to do this, then we, domain B, you drop the quarter quantities. So it's OK. If you have this quantity, you don't, just you don't book, bookkeep all that. And C actually is a slightly easier where you deliver, where you can more or less in, in one time step deliver everything that is relevant for, for an order on the shelf. So more or less as, as if in one time step someone can pick everything that is relevant. So the plans get shorter. And then we also have a domain M, some, somehow to have something that is close to maps, right? But here the idea is we enforce this simply by generating benchmarks where each order each order has a order ask for a single product with a single quantity, and on each shelf there is only a single order with a single quantity. So we simulate this within this framework, right? To the the the, the situation that we did before. Good. Um, so this is and so this is actually the then if we just do this M thing, and this is again a problem that you can solve with with ASP in half a minute. But this is a plan now that's actually the one that you were trying to animate, right? So now for, I think 40 robots moving to 40 destinations. And again, it's just animated because there's, there's not much going on otherwise with, with orders and stuff. That's just more or less moving to, moving to, to, to the destination and, uh, and um, no delivery is going on. But you already see some of the difference. If, this is, if you just have a problem that about mo movement, how much more you can do right, in, in the same amount of time, right? And how much actually this additional complexity restricts yourself. So again, both problems were solved in about the same amount of time, roughly, right? Good, so let's look a little bit how this works. So what do, how, how, how do we describe instances? Actually, we, we, we decided to go back to the old object attribute valued format. And normally, when, when I actually, when I, well, the first thing that I do, I rewrite this in my format, right? But again, this is something very generic that's easy to, to extend, right? Um, so you have, um, it, that's the initial, it describes the initial situation. T is an object type, I is an identifier, all of these guys have identifiers, and you have an attribute and, and a value. And so, for instance, in the, in the basic system, so these are the types. You have, can have a, a node, a highway, a robot, a shelf, picking station, product order, and then there are different attributes. So, when a robot has two attributes, it can be at a certain position, and it can carry something. And uh, um, an order actually uh, has an, an order line, which more or less, an order line is which product and, how, and the quantity that, that it needs. And no, currently, we assign the picking station where this order has to, to, to go to. Again, this is a subproblem by itself. You may, you may say that you wanted to solve this problem with to, to where to go uh, by yourself. Then, for instance, here, if robot 34 is at position 2, 3, this is then encoded by this here. Uh, you have a, a type. This is a robot. That's the ID. And it's the attribute that it sits at, at, at grid position 2, 3, right? So we, again, we try to have a very generic format that is easily extensible, right? This is, this is not supposed to be nice, right? Uh, and here, ag again, looking a bit closer, so for instance, we, we also, uh, perhaps, we, perhaps not every encoding needs all the information, right? So we have, the, we have numbered the nodes. So each node has an ID as well, the, if one wants to work with that. Because for instance, in, the, in one of the set encodings, you also gave all these guys IDs, right? So you don't work with coordinates. and uh, and the position of this node actually is at 1, 1. So this, this describes this guy here. And actually, this is a highway node as well, and, uh, which is highway node 1. It has the same value. So uh, Then here, it's, it's about the picking station. So it's, an, it's node 7. It's the position is 7, 1. This is this picking station here. It has picking station. It's picking station 2. And that's, that's, the, that's where it sits, right? Pretty straightforward. Now, um, uh, this is a, about the robots as such. So there is a. This is the node, node 47 again, and this is 26. So 26, where, where the heck? So here, yeah, this should be this guy here. Um, and um, it, sits, it sits at this position. Th that's the node. And, and this robot here, robot 2, sits also at that position. Its maximum energy is currently 0. And, uh, and its energy is also 0, right? So, um, so this is more or less how you describe this. In the same way, actually, you then describe order. So this is more or less the, this is the, 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 the layout of the warehouse. And then, of course, you have to talk about what is on the shelves. Um, so again, so shelf 3 sits on 8.3. Uh, 8.3 should be this one here. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's shelf 3 at that position. And then you have to describe what is on the shelf. So there is um, pro product, and it's called 1, 2, and 3. These are the products. And so product 1 um, has 
product one has well three three Three, three items of product one are sitting on shelf three. <sighs> Took a while. <laughs> yeah, anyway, but you know, this is more for machines, right, than, than for us, right? So, um, and, and the same actually for the order. So this, is, this was actually here the shell information that, that uh, I forgot to, to point to. So th the information here was, is also here, can be visualized, it can be checked here. And this is actually the, the order information. And just in the more or less the same syntax, this is order number three that has to be delivered to picking station two. And it has actually two order lines. Uh, product one should be, there should be one quantity of product one. And for product three, there should be three. But that, that's a bit the, the, this. And this is the way how you describe your benchmarks. And of, and of course, we now, we, we, of course, our, our format is a bit fact oriented, like in logic programming, right? That you have these, these predicates and these, these terms inside. But I think once you have a parser, you read this and you, you, you have your data structure and you do with it what, what you want. So you now, this is the input. Now let's look at the output. How, what what uh, does actually the system expect to check the solution or to visualize it? It more or less, it's just a fact format occurs. That mo and it's very simple. It's just that here we have an object and here we have an action. Let's just jump to the examples, right? So we, we currently have mainly these. These are the main actions here. Move, pick up, put down, and deliver. And move goes in the cardinal uh, directions. Uh, pick up and put down currently don't have any arguments. Again, you may, you may have to want to add this. So the idea is more or less um, when you add a position, then you don't explicitly say what you, what you, what you pick up. Well, there has, if there is a shelf, then this is successful. If there's none, well, there, there's nothing, right? Um, and uh, deliver actually w deliver is an explicit. Well, is deliver is here? Um, how to say? We have it as an action simply because we want to visualize it as well, right? But it's not actually. It's not something that that is an action that takes place. Actually, if you are at a at a picking station, at least in our solutions, actually we then we then say, oh, a deliver action is happening. But that's more than our encoding like this, right? Good, and and. and then this is actually, this is then the, the solution that is given here. You see that this is, these are like all these facts and occurs, and also then, then at each time point, three actions, or at, at most three actions are executed, and it, this is visualized, right? That's more or less what, what, here you have the format, and that's then how it is visualized and, 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 and put out. Good. Okay, now let's look at, um, <coughs> at the instance generator. So, Again, this is a tool that allows you to automatically generate instances of different, f different forms and sizes. So I think the, it, it has about 60 options. So Philip, who implemented that, really took, took, a, lot, took a lot of efforts here. Um, and what you can do, you can configure the grid dimension, number of shelves, robots, etc., the grid type. There we have three different types. So one is actually random. You can randomly generate. Uh, um, uh, fields or structured and structured is more or less in the way that we've already seen, right? With these storage areas, or you can start with a template and then customize it. You mo for more or less give it a template and then these things are populated, and it, it supports different domains and stuff like this. So we, we implemented this with, with Python and ASP. That's perhaps not so interesting now here. And here just just some ex to run you just three examples. So if you want to, to, to generate a 9 times 6 grid, you just give these, these options here. Then if the storage zones have to have a certain form, you give these are the options. Nine shelves, two picking stations, two robots, four products and 60 uh, product units, maximum per shelf, four orders, two order lines, all products. And, and the mi minus H option says it should be structured, structured in the sense that you have these zones. And so if you do that, you, you give this call. This is, for instance, one thing that you may expect as a solution, right? Uh, and in the same way, well, this is, of course, only the layout, but what it also generates, of course, which, which came with the options are the, what is on the shelves and how an order set. And from this, this is, of course, now a call where you get one, but there are also options to generate where you say, oh, I want 100 different ones, right? Or whatever, right? Um, that's a random instance now. Again, it's, it's mainly... Um, if random is more or less the default. You give no specific option. Oh, no, actually, you have here you have the minus minus option. Um, and um, yeah, let's just give you an example. That's more instance how this can be randomly then generated. So you have a six times six a grid, 20 shelves, um, 10 robots, six picking stations, and bam, here's a random, here's a random thing for it. So 
So for, for, the, for the customized one, so this is something that where you could, would go in the visual editor and you would actually do this by hand with the mouse, right? So then you have this, this as an underlying structure and then you, you put it in and, and the random generator on top you would, would, would then more or less gen gener generate your benchmark, benchmark suits on, on top of this, right? That's more or less the idea here. Good, so if this is, for instance, then something that you may get as one instance on, the, on this customized uh, uh, on this customized layout before. Now here it has populated it for you according to certain parameters that you gave. And here you see this is more or less what, what th that's the, the customized layout. Then you give this as an input and, 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 and the th things are generated on top of it. Uh, good, so let, let, let's look at the visualizer. <coughs> Again, the visualizer allows you to visualize instances so more or less, how does an instance look like if you wanted to look at it or edit it and, and plan. So this is the animation part. Um, and as you've already seen, so it, it, it animates the execution just by executing each action at, e at each time point without actually, without checking that it's correct, right? Um, and you can actually use it also as an editor for, for editing instances as I, as I showed you. So let's, for instance, look at look at this here in a, in, a, in a little video. So here you, for instance, say, well, you want to to, to load an instance, then uh, you do so. Here you are. Um, then you can then if you hover over if you hover over this, you actually see what is what is on the respective on the respective uh, fields. What what robot is what ID there is? Then you can look at the orders in that or the, or the products actually. The sub, sub window opens. You can click on that. What is on what is on the respective shelves, and the same actually for the orders. So you now look at the orders that are there, and you can also just in inspect the. This is more or less. You have an instance, and you now inspect it. And we will see in a sec actually that you can e how how you can even modify that. Okay, this is how you visualize things. That's what we've already seen. There's nothing new, actually, how to visualize a plan, right? So more or less, you, the, the, this solution here was loaded, either actually via the, via the menu or you piped it in, and then actually the plan is executed. But you've seen this now three times, so I think there's, before you fall asleep, uh, we'll go to the next. Then editing an instance. So this is actually, uh, you have, let's say you, you loaded an instance, now you can actually change it. You can remove things, uh, replace them el elsewhere. So you, you, you just actually, th then you can uh, remove a highway node and, dis and just add a picking station there, for instance. Then here you actually put another robot inside. You remove a shelf. And then you see again that this is all here documented in the, in, the, in the same way. You add a shelf. You may then put, you move a shelf. Where wh the, the real cool thing is actually this now, you actually, undo things and you, you take away these grids. So you actually create obstacles. So this is actually not part of the grid anymore. So for instance, with this corridor that we saw, we've, saw, we, we've seen before, now actually there is a certain bottleneck. And you can just edit these things in, in that way. Yeah, and the, in the same way, you can then, this is now the board that can go, into the, can go into the shelves. And you can say, oh, you want to add products. You want to change the quantities of things. So this is now. Your, you add a product, you give it, you take the ID, the product, ad, uh, the product quantity in this. That works for, for what is on the shelves. And in the same way, actually, also for the orders that you get. This way, you can more or less design a bit. Because, you know, once, once you play with your things, you want to have some corner cases and stuff like that. That's an easy way, actually, to just to have some with which, with which you work at the beginning. But I think it's, it's pretty obvious. Now, let's, let's, let's just move on. Because I see too many cell phones coming out. <laughs> Yeah, so what, what we also did is, is a solution checker. This is more or less something that we just implemented in ASP where the input is a plan and, the, and, and this checker will just check it and then give you solutions to, to it. So that, let's just see this. So the idea is actually the, the visualizer will visualize the thing independent of the errors, right? And perhaps you will even not catch it with the eye. But, <coughs> and actually, this is now an animated, this is not, so the checker normally works on a, on a shell, on a sh uh, in, in a shell version. So here, for instance, here a collision is detected, right? And this is just visualized now in, in parallel, right? And so you can have, then here, for instance, there's a diagonal movement, right? The, the, the checker will actually give you this error message. 
but again on, on the shell, right? This is a, a, a mocked up uh, animation. And there are other mistakes that may happen, and, and, and this, these are all detected by the checker, right? And uh, uh, I think you've, se you've seen enough videos, right? And so for instance, here, this, you, the way you, this works, you actually call the ASP system with, your, with, your, with, the, with the original instance, the plan that you gave, and then you, you, you get these error messages here, and you can, read, you, you can deep start debugging. Pretty straightforward. So we also did, again, now this was the, the, the very generic part, right? Where you can use it to, 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 to work with this or, or, or use your own, your, your own systems to solve these things. So we also did some reference encodings in ASP. And this is, for instance, an ASP encoding for the, for the routing, right? So what you, s you have one action. This is the move action, which more or less says at each time point, each robot can have at most one move action. So this means it can wait and do nothing or do at most one, right? And then uh, this is actually when, w if, if a robot was at this position at time point t plus one, it then moves. It's at another position at the next time point when if this position ad adjusts to it, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So just to give you an idea and actually how this, how this looks in, in, in ASP. And so then if you then do, this is then the, the, the fulfillment of orders. And this is roughly then an, an encoding of a map, of, of a map F problem, right? Movement and orders. So just to give an, an expression, not to make you run out of this, of this room, now if we now solve whole, a whole scenario with everything, with routing, transport, and delivery, this is more or less the thing. So you have to add these other actions, pick up and put down, uh, and then you have to say what it, what it means that the robot, that what, what, when it picks something up, puts something down, when it serves something, and et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's also the goal situation, right? This is more or less the, the ASP encoding. Value. But again, you don't have to, to use these, 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 uh, these things at all to use the Esprilo system. That's just more or less just our reference encodings with which we, we like to work. Yeah, then, actually summing up. So actually, we already have experienced it now that Esprilo is really great in, in for research as well as for teaching. So we actually even had the first students actually that went out to industry, and then this industry came back and they wanted to know more about that. So it's, a, it's a very cool demo tool that the students actually can take out, out, of, out of the university and show, show to people what, what can your technology do, right? Uh, and that's, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. For us, it's also nice that whenever we, we, we want to explore new features, the system is open. So one thing, for instance, we added recently was, was this energy consumption th things, and, and now we work on deadline and durations. And these are all KR topics that, that are interesting just per se, right? And now you can actually experiment with it also in a in a certain setting. And this more or less summers, sums up again the, the, the different features. And well, again, it's an open system. Uh, well, you, your students have been using it, right? They have been in touch, so that uh, your students use it too, right? And so just go there, join, download it, contribute, even better, right? And uh, I think I'm at the end now with that stuff. So we then go back to Roman. Or Oh, yes, yes. What do you have?
I want to get it. Oh, no idea. Okay, never mind. Okay, never mind. I, I, no, I, I, I'll figure it out. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, it's showing? Okay. Yeah, uh, on the meanwhile, I'll just say that, that the, I, I learned about Asprilo only in February from, from, from Tosten and, and Son. And since then, I gave it to a couple of uh, graduate students as a course project, not as a graduate. And they were able to, to, to merge with this like, almost seamlessly. And they were so very, so very cool. So this is really like, a good framework to, to play with in pathfinding and planning algorithms. So that, that was very, very nice, I think. OK. So, yeah, so, so we've seen the, all this, right? So, OK. So, so, okay, so, so uh, what I want to do, I, I want to, uh, first of all, if you have forgotten, my name is Oni. <laughs> I, 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 I want to wrap up the tutorial, but also to point up several uh, challenges that I think uh, deserve more research, and also to give some pointers for follow-up work. If you want to, if you have been interested in this, uh, then <coughs> there is, I want to give some pointers of papers and benchmarks and these kind of things. Uh, but first, I, 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 I want to start very, uh, um, um, very, very high level. You know, th there is all these, uh, 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 you know, newsstands about AI be controlling the world and all that. So I don't know about general AI, but at least in pathfinding. So w w what you can see here, assuming that it will run. <laughs> so this is a, a, from a, a very recent video game, and you can see the multi-agent pathfinding that it's doing. So take a look. This is just you know putting the group from one side to another. <sighs> I, I don't know about AI ruling the world, but uh, at least the pathfinding uh, <laughs> not optimal. <laughs> Let's say it like, like that. Uh, this is very recent. This is like pr from less than a year ago. Um, okay, so, so, so why, why I like to work on multi pathfinding, and I think maybe, maybe Roman and Tosten also. So first of all, this is the real world problem, uh, as we already talked about. Uh, but on the other hand, it's very, very challenging. Uh, and it's a multi planning problem. And it's a challenging real world multi planning problem. And the other reason that is that there is no clear dominant approach. So, so and, and for me, it's very cool because I can, I can do some search work, I can do some, some compilation work, I can do some SAT solving, and all of this, these are all valid approaches for solving this problem. So it really allows you to, to open you to, to different approaches and you can play with, with them. Uh, another reason is that uh, here, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real world problem where execution is very, very different from planning. And this opens up to many, many uh, challenges, that are, challenges that are left uh, to, uh, to be done in this specific type of problem. Uh, one of them, uh, which I've worked a little bit about, but I think deserves more, I I is the problem of uh, uh, self-interested agents. So we, are, we assume so far that when we give an agent a plan, they at least try to execute it. Uh, but let's say that we are these two people, A and B. I am A, and let's say that you are B. Okay, and we are trying to do a multi path pathfinding problem. So what is the solution here? One has to go to the, but who? You might create a plan where A needs to go here and B needs to go there, but I would never do that. I, I would go there and try to, to speed up. So, 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 so how, how, how can we create a, a, a mechanisms where agents won't end up doing this? Right? And, and this becomes very important when you talk about autonomous vehicles, which is a domain for multi pathfinding. Uh, so so uh, what is other agent is, is maybe uh, uh, not adversarial, but self-interested or human. So <laughs> what to do? Um, so, so a little bit of work on, on that, very, very small work by, by uh, Tzach Ibn Naya and others. Uh, so what you can see here, so the y-axis is, is the cost. However, you see here black and blue cost. Okay, so, so uh, the selfish, that's where every agent is selfish and it tries to, to do whatever it wants. And you see the cost is very high. The, the other approach is, is when you add some taxation mechanism. And this is, these are several taxation mechanisms. We're using the most congested area cost you more. And you can see that even if you add a little bit of, the blue is the tax. A little bit of tax, you can get uh, to a more efficient solution in, even if the agents are self-interested. But however, this is just, you know, very, uh, the approach is, uh, and I am one of the authors, so I, I can uh, say th bad things about, about this work. This is a very simplistic approach. And there is all this li literature and work on multi planning and self-interested and mechanism design. So doing work on that, I think, is really uh, an important step to making this happen in the real world. Um, also, to get this to work on robot robotics, there are um, a, a lot of challenges, continuous space, time, things that have been discussed already. Um, uh, like for, for example, you can take the ad kinematic constraint. This is, was done by, by Hang Ma. This is Hang, by the way. Uh, um, 
if you, if you want to go for traffic management, so, so what you can see here, this is a picture from Israel, where I'm from, and this is the fast lane to Tel Aviv. So Tel Aviv is a very congested area, and the, this is a toll road, and it's a dynamic toll road. It has, there are many of, of those like in the world, right? Well, well if you go through, uh, the cost depends on how many people go there. So again, if you want to do it for traffic, and, and multi-path finding, and agents who are interested, then there are challenges, and maybe flow-based approach are better. Uh, there is not a directly collision there, but there is, it, it gets more costly to go through an area if it has been more congested, so how to do that, that's a challenge. How to scale, that's a challenge also. Um, I think in particular, for ICAPs, it's interesting to note the relation between uh, multi pathfinding and multi planning in general. Uh, and, and, and basically, pathfind, multi pathfinding is a special case of multi planning. But it's interesting to, to, to look at the difference between them. So multi planning, map in general, there are many, many, many models for that. Many, uh, like huge literature for many years. A lot of work on uncertainty, DECOM DPs, and these kind of, these, all these kind of things. However, I think it, I, I won't be very insulting to other people by saying that most work on multi planning does not scale to hundreds of agents. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, multi pathfinding is a relatively, f uh, relatively newer, I would say, field. There are fewer models. Uh, uh, most work has been done on the classical, discrete, everything is nice, but this is growing. Uh, uh, there is not a lot of work on uncertainty. There is some work by Glenn Wagner or New Amstar, but, but not a lot of work on that. Uh, 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 however, we do scale well to, to more than 100 agents. So it's very interesting, I think, especially in, in, the, in, in ICAPS, I think, to look at, think about how to cross-fertilize, how to think, take ideas from like, richer models to, to map, and to some of the algorithms from map to, to, to more general map. Uh, and I think one motivating example uh, is this. Uh, so this is a, a video from a, a company called Autostore. Uh, there, this is a Norway-based uh, company. Let's see if this works. I'm almost there, yes. Okay, I, I, it's not important, and uh, maybe you can, can uh, reduce the sound. Uh, the, 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 it's not really important like, what they're doing, but, but I think the, the thing is, oh, I'll, 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 take, I'll, I'll let you look. Okay, I think it's, it's quite cool. Robots, on the other hand, shouldn't have to. I'm not funded by them or anything, it's just nice. Okay. So why waste time on shelf-based solutions when AutoStore is here? Hmm. AutoStore is a cube-based system, making use of all space for proper warehousing. Turn that wasteful air into storage and double, triple, or even quadruple the inventory capacity without moving to a new building. Bins are stacked right next to each other, on top of each other. Radio-controlled robots drive on tracks above the cube, lifts down to grab bins and deliver them to workstations for order fulfillment or replenishment. All operations get done efficiently and accurately. Okay, I, I don't know if you managed to follow up what, what's going on here. The, the cool thing is the, the, it's, it's the same as the Amazon warehouses and others, but there's no corridors. So the way they get to a bin, they go from the top, and if they want to get something down, they need to dig it up. So if you think about it, this is a reversed multi-agent multi -agent blocks world problem, right? So, so I think it's really cool to, think, to, 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 try to, to try to work on that, because here, robots can help each other. And this is the key difference between multi planning and multi pathfinding. In pathfinding, agents can only annoy one another. It's better for me if you're not driving in the car now, because for me, it'll be better. But if, if, if I'm working in this setting, maybe you can dig up some stuff that I need. So this, this opens up to, I think, interesting uh, directions. Uh, also, I want to say about, about multi fact finding, and this is, this is where I'm going to do something not, not nice to do. Um, so th all this work on, on topic, and I'm doing it for uh, good reasons. Let me um, let's see if I can do that. Okay, so, so there was a, 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 a Sonor and, and Torsten already talked about a, how to, to, to combine a task allocation and, and pathfinding, but I think there is a lot of work to do be done. And I th I'm showing this slide because maybe you look at it and, and you're seeing something that repeats here a bit. Yeah, okay, I hope that's very clear. Okay, so, so the, the, the most work so far is done by Hang Ma, which is here. So he does a lot of cool stuff, but I think there's a lot of additional things to do. So also, if you're interested, you can talk to him. Um, so that was the, that was the, the only thing I wanted to show. Uh, and the last thing I want to show, okay. Uh, let's see. Yes. Is that uh, uh, for me, 
in, in for Roman and also for so on, we are now finishing, I think, what we can call the grand tour. We gave this tutorial in, in AMAS, in AAAI, and now in our ICAPS. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's and what's the, the coolest thing about it is that in, in AMAS, when we started, uh, uh, at least at the beginning of the tutorial, it was very scary. We had two people in the crowd. It was very, uh, <laughs> we, we were starting to sweat. Uh, eventually, we had more people, but it's really nice to see like uh, the growth of people uh, going that's, that's interested in this work. And just to, to, to try to convince you how hot a topic this is, so this is a, a, a list of papers from AAAI, ICAPS, and HKI, which has the word multi pathfinding in them. Uh, and, and this is just for this year. Okay, so this, this topic, is, this field is really, really growing. There is a dedicated session for this in SOX this year also. So, so it's really a, a growing, and there is a community, so I invite you all to, to work on that. Uh, and there's also some, some papers that, that, that might give you a good intro. There's a survey on search-based approach from uh, SOX 17. Uh, there's the, there's the paper, okay, now I'm publishing myself, this is my paper. Uh, or, but there is a long list of authors, not, 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 not just me, about the uh, definition and variants. Uh, there is a very good website called map.info by Sven Koenig's group, where you have a lot of the, uh, links for tutorials and papers and benchmarks and videos, really, really comprehensive website to, to start getting interested in, uh, in that. Uh, and there is a, a set of benchmarks uh, for uh, at least the classic, classical multiple pathfinding uh, by Nathan Stutterbrandt. Uh, and, and of course, this is not, uh, notwithstanding all the things you've just seen from, uh, from, from, from uh, 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 Asprilo. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's it. Okay, any questions or comments? Comments? Okay. Hello. Um, this was the, the organizers uh, asked us to say. To say. Uh, there is the, the uh, reception, I think it's called, right? Uh, uh, so this is, this is the, the map of how to get there. This is the timing. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs>